You have probably heard of the 4% rule for retirement spending, which says that you can safely spend 4% of an investment portfolio in the first year of retirement, and then adjust that dollar amount for inflation each year for the rest of your life with minimal risk of running out of money. The 4% rule relies on biased data. Recent research corrects for these data biases and suggests a safe withdrawal rate that is somewhere between 2 and 3%, depending on the portfolio being tested and the life expectancy of the investor. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital, and I'm going to tell you why 2.7% is the new 4% for safe retirement spending. Financial planner William Bengen wrote a paper in 1994 titled Determining Withdrawal Rates Using Historical Data. Bengen took historical data for U.S. stocks and intermediate-term treasuries and tested how long a portfolio of 50% stocks and 50% bonds would be able to sustain various levels of withdrawals, stated as a starting percentage of the portfolio, and adjusted for inflation thereafter. The result is an historically safe spending rate, which Bengen determined to be 4% in his data. In the 2022 paper, Popular Personal Financial Advice Versus the Professors, James Choi reviews the 50 most popular personal finance books and finds that most of them recommend a 4% or higher safe spending rule. According to a recent survey from Vanguard, 22% of millennials are planning for early retirement based on the 4% rule. Anecdotally, I can tell you that lots of people holding themselves out as personal finance experts do indeed advocate for using the 4% rule. The primary problems with the 4% rule are that it was based on a 30-year withdrawal period, which may not be long enough for many people today, and it was based on U.S. stocks and bonds. We know today, looking backward, that the U.S. has been one of the best-performing equity markets in the world. But it's less clear that the U.S. experience is representative of expected returns going forward. In forming expectations, it's important to ask why we got the outcome that we did before assuming that it's going to repeat itself. U.S. stock returns have been so much higher than economic models would have predicted them to be that the phenomenon has been referred to as the equity premium puzzle. There have been many events historically that did not happen, which, if they had happened, would likely have materially affected the experience of U.S. investors. For example, the U.S. was not heavily impacted economically on their home soil by either World War, and the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved peacefully without the economic devastation that could have occurred in an alternate reality. U.S. investors were compensated for taking the risks that these catastrophic outcomes could have materialized, and they were compensated for the good fortune that none of them did. To make this point quantitatively, the 2022 paper Is the United States a Lucky Survivor? a hierarchical Bayesian approach, evaluates the effects of survivorship and luck on realized U.S. equity returns from the perspective of an investor in 1920. They find that the realized historical risk premium on U.S. stocks exceeds the expected premium by 2%. This excess return is approximately equally split between contributions from luck, where cash flows ended up being higher than expected due to disasters that did not materialize, and learning, where investors lower their required return on U.S. stocks over time as catastrophes do not happen, driving up U.S. equity valuations. Looking backward at the return on U.S. stocks and assuming that they will repeat is not only a bet that there will be more good luck, but that there will be enough good luck to more than offset the currently low expected returns. An alternative approach, and the one that I think is much more sensible in developing a safe withdrawal rate, is to draw from the full sample of developed equity markets, including the ones that had bad returns or failed completely. That is exactly what is done in the 2022 paper, The Safe Withdrawal Rate, Evidence from a Broad Sample of Developed Markets. The authors use a comprehensive data set of real returns for domestic equity, international equity, and government bonds in developed economies to investigate safe withdrawal rates. The data cover approximately 2,500 years of asset class returns in 38 developed countries over the period 1890 to 2019. They include data for countries that don't typically make it into historical data sets because the market failed or the data are otherwise difficult to obtain. Using this survivorship and easy data bias corrected data set, the authors test safe withdrawal rates. 
They test a portfolio of 60% domestic stocks and 40% domestic bonds, various alternative asset allocations from 0% domestic stocks all the way up to 100%, a target date fund that shifts more into bonds over time, and in unreported analysis, one of the co-authors also tests 60% stock and 40% bond portfolios with various levels of international stock diversification. They use a block bootstrap simulation method to draw samples from the historical data. The result is a broad range of possible investment experiences that draws on the range of possible outcomes across the countries and time periods in the sample. Rather than using a fixed 30-year withdrawal period like the original 4% rule research did, they use mortality tables from the US Social Security Administration to incorporate longevity risk into their analysis. Based on these data, the mean life expectancy for a couple age 65 in 2022 is 24.7 years but the 5th percentile is 12.3 years, whereas the 95th percentile is 35.5 years. They include this variability in their simulations. With this setup, they find for a 65-year-old couple in 2022 investing in domestic developed market stocks and bonds that the 4% rule has a 17.4% chance of depleting financial wealth prior to death and a 16% chance of depleting wealth and living another five years. Allowing for a 5% probability of financial ruin, they find a 2.26% safe withdrawal rate for a domestic investor, which is, clearly, much less than 4%. Across alternative asset allocations from 0% stocks through 100% stocks, domestic stocks, they find that the 60-40 portfolio gives the highest safe withdrawal rate, so at least in this data, getting more aggressive with stocks doesn't help to increase safe spending. They also find that the target date fund underperforms the 60-40 portfolio. Adding an allocation to international stocks to the 60-40 portfolio improves the numbers. For that same 2022 retiree, moving 24% of the portfolio, 40% of the equity portion of the portfolio, into international stocks improves the safe withdrawal rate to 2.85%, and moving 90% of the equity portfolio into international stocks brings it to 3.02%. These numbers account for an additional 0.5% in costs for owning international stocks over domestic stocks to try and capture the typically higher fees and less favorable tax treatment in both taxable and non-taxable accounts. There is one more big consideration before we settle on a reasonable safe withdrawal rate based on these data. Our 65-year-old American couple in 2022 expects to live a mean of 24.7 years in retirement. But American retirees in 2065 young adults today expect to live 27.6 years, and American retirees in 2085, newborns today, expect to live 28.7 years based on current mortality tables. I'm Canadian, not American, and Canadians live, on average, longer than Americans. A Canadian couple retiring today has a 50% chance of living another 29 years. In addition to that, people with higher levels of educational attainment tend to live significantly longer than average. These longevity adjustments have a meaningful impact on safe spending. The 2085 American retiree who expects to live in retirement about as long as a Canadian 65-year-old today can safely sustain a spending rate closer to 2.7% with an internationally diversified 60-40 portfolio. These figures do not account for taxes, so a taxable investor may need to revise the numbers down further. There are a couple of important lessons here. One is that the 4% rule is not a sustainable spending rate when you look outside the US and account for the risk of living a long life. The other is that international diversification matters a lot. I think I'll do another video just on that topic. I know this video is not gonna fill people with optimism, but the good news is that withdrawal rates are not that useful anyway. We don't use them in financial planning. The constant withdrawals used in safe withdrawal rate analysis are inferior to variable withdrawals for sustainable spending. Someone probably won't, or at least I hope that they won't, blindly follow a withdrawal rule all the way down to a depleted portfolio while they're still alive. People will make adjustments to their spending or they'll find ways to make income. On top of that, the required portfolio withdrawals needed to maintain spending will likely decrease over time as things like government pensions kick in and those government pensions will help to hedge against the risk of living longer than expected. There are other strategies too, like deferring government pensions as long as possible to increase their benefit, or allocating a portion of the retirement portfolio to annuities. Even beyond that, some empirical evidence suggests that retirees don't increase their spending with inflation over time. They tend to increase their spending at a rate that trails inflation by about 1%. 
Safe withdrawal rates typically assume constant inflation-adjusted withdrawals. Finally, the data we have discussed are based on investing in a market capitalization-weighted index portfolio of domestic and international stocks and government bonds. Tilting a portfolio towards smaller and lower-priced stocks and corporate bonds, which theory and evidence suggest have higher expected returns, is likely to help improve safe withdrawal rates. But importantly, we're talking about improving a baseline 2.7% safe spending rate, not a 4% rate. Most safe withdrawal rate analysis supporting a 4% safe spending rate is based on historical US data, which is ex post one of the best performing financial markets in documented history. Drawing on a comprehensive data set that accounts for survivorship and easy data biases spanning 38 developed countries from 1890 to 2019, and accounting for longevity risk gives a much more realistic and sobering view on the safe withdrawal rate, which I estimate at 2.7%. Thanks for watching. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information. Real quick before you go, if you're thinking that these data from 1890 are too old to be useful to an investor today because the world has changed, I had the same thought. I want you to listen to what Scott Cedarberg, one of the co-authors of this research, said when we asked him about that on the Rational Reminder podcast. I can hear listeners wondering, like with all the change of, in market structure, technology, competitiveness, information, does that change the applicability of this information? How do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, we've, we've certainly thought about that a lot. Um, there's a couple aspects. Like, like one, if, if you look back at return day, like it doesn't look that different in the early part than, than the later part. Like hmm. you, you think about the massive changes in the way that everything's traded and just all the, the, the economic developments that have been and technological developments. Uh, but it, it's still, you know, some people coming together and trading some stocks that are reflecting some macroeconomic conditions and all this sort of, of, of stuff. Uh, the other thing that we've done is, is at least like post-war we, we can just basically chop off everything uh, World War II and prior, and we're pretty similar estimates on, on like loss probabilities. Um, our, our earlier paper with the, in the JFE that, that we just looked at stocks, we, we had one specification there. We, we did every starting period from 1841 to 2000 in that one. And the loss probability just using post 2000 data, we were estimating was like 19%. So it doesn't seem like the more recent data is indicative that there's just no more tail risk. Wow. Uh, and, and like Japan starting in 90 is another example where it's just sometimes things can, you know, like, like that was Japan and the U S were, were by far the two largest stock markets in the world at that time. So it's not, not even just small markets and, and it's not just wars. Uh, there's just some, there's some risks.